like from uh, Mike Talon. Oh, yeah. You're more than welcome to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Utah, I'm Go ahead and announce that in your uh, committee reports. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I didn't want to. I... Good evening, everybody. Let's get this show going so we can get out of here quick. You know me, I like to get out of here as fast as we can, but do the good business we do. I'll leave before your term's up. I got one more month. <laughs> we could cancel February. <laughs> A little bit spunky tonight. Yeah. All right, so I'd like to call to order the uh, Dr. Cog Board of Directors uh, January 15th board meeting. Would you all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you very much. Uh, can I have roll call, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> okay, Eva Henry. Here. Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. Here. William Lindstedt. Here. Randy Wheelock. Here. <laughs> Excuse me. Nicholas Williams. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Patridge. Partridge, my apologies. <laughs> Ron Angles, Libby Zabo, okay. Mike Kaufman, Allison Coombs, Larry Vidum, David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Margot Ramson, Adam Cushing, Roger Hudson, George Teal. Tammy Maurer, yes. Jeremy Fay, yes. Randy Wheel, yes. Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Nicole Frank, yes. Jackie Thomas, Catherine Whitman, yes. Steve Conklin, yes. Linda Olson, yes. Bill Gipp, yes. Linda Montoya, yes. Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Rachel Binkley, Present. Jim Dale, Here. George Lance, Dave Kerber, Here. Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Here. Dana Gutwein, Jacob LeBure, Here. Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Here. Larry Strock, Here. Wynne Shaw, Here. Joan Peck, Here. Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Arnie Drystadt, Joyce Palazuski, Paul Sutton, Sean Ferre, Chris Larson, Julie Dran Mullica, John Dyack, Sally Daigle, Dave Black, Sandy Hammerly, <laughs> and to you, Jessica Sandgren, <coughs> Julia Marvin, <coughs> Herb Atchison, yeah. Bud Starker, yeah. Adam Zarin, Rebecca White, Bill Van Meter. Here. And we have a quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And I'd like to welcome some new members as of today. Mayor Mike Kaufman of the city of Ar uh, Aurora. Let's say Arvada. <laughs> Aurora, excuse me. <laughs> Arvada is before Aurora in the alphabet, so. Uh, Mayor Linda Matoya, C city of Federal Heights. <laughs> Adam uh, Cushing of uh, city of Brighton. Uh, I see a member. We have a seat up here for you.
Before I continue, do uh, all members, are all the members uh, sitting at the table up, up this way? I want to make sure all our members are up here. So we have one more spot right here if you'd like to join us. Uh, any alternates for now, if, you're, if your primary member's here, i got to put you out to the audience. Uh, moving right along on to the new alternates, uh, Celeste uh, Arner of City of Federal Heights. <laughs> Pamela Grove of City of Littleton. <laughs> Dave Kerber of the City of Greenwood Village. <laughs> Allison, uh, uh, is it Combs or Coombs? Uh, of the City of Aurora. I don't know if you're here. And Deborah, uh, is it Mulvey? Of the city of Castle Pines. All right, I think that's all I have. Boy, we got a full house. It's probably because you guys all think it's my last meeting, right? <laughs> You're gonna celebrate my, or are you getting excited for John to become the new chair? I know, <laughs> this board. Uh, so I move to approve the agenda. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, we've done carries. We'll move on to item number five, the community spotlight, City of Inglewood. Okay. So that's why everybody came tonight. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Good point. Fair enough. So um, I'm going to do two pieces here. I'm Linda Olson, and... Uh, my staff at the city of Englewood are amazing. They produced a video for tonight. We have a new communication director and a couple of former um, newscasters from the area, and they decided I should have a video. So they must not think I can speak. But <laughs> no, but actually they did a really bang up job. But uh, one of the things I wanted to do, because sometimes people get really confused about where Englewood really is. It's this sweet little first tier city just south of, of uh, Denver. And uh, there's a lot of Annex Arapahoe County that is Englewood on its address, as you know, and we wish we had the tax benefits from that, but we don't. But this is where we sit, and there's some parts of it that jut up into Denver in some ways that people often think that part is is Denver and not Englewood, but it's an amazing little little place. It's 6.6 um, .6 square miles, so we're really landlocked and no development other than in full or redevelopment. Um, this is our sort of age demographics. <coughs> we're really kind of a broad uh, demographic age-wise with a growing population of older folks and younger folks, so it's an interesting um, growing areas on both ends of the of the age group. And then some of the demographics were, you know, 74, 75 uh, percent white, identifying white, and then um, different ethnicities and uh, racial backgrounds that are continuing to make our community very rich, but we're largely a, a white community. Um, I think the median cost of a house is a little higher than that. I think they were using an older one. I think it's more like 350,000. So, but um, I wish it was like that, and if we can find some homes like that, it'd be great, because then we'd have a little bit more affordability. So um, the next thing is the actual video, which tells you quite a bit about our transportation uh, projects that we've been doing, and it moves at a really fast clip, So, but it's three minutes long, and I'll answer questions when we're done. Innovation in transportation is rooted in Inglewood's history. The world-famous Cherylin trolley once carried passengers to the top of southbound Broadway at Quincy. The horse was then taken on board for the ride back to the bottom. As transportation needs in Inglewood evolve, so too does the city's rapid response. The city's... Innovation in transportation is rooted in Inglewood's history. The world-famous Cherylin trolley once carried passengers to the top of southbound Broadway at Quincy. The horse was then taken on board for the ride back to the bottom. As transportation needs in Inglewood evolve, so too does the city's rapid response. The city's bike lanes are ready to ride. The bike lanes are on Dartmouth Avenue and run both ways from University to Inca Street. The new lanes improve connections with other bike facilities and will hopefully get you out pedaling. 
The city of Inglewood is working to address the changing transportation needs of a growing population. Current commuters sometimes run into a traffic bottleneck as three lanes merge into two on US 285 beneath Broadway. To correct the problem, a $9.5 million project will draw funds from multiple sources. Those include $7,600,000 drawn from federal funds. The city of Inglewood will contribute $1.1 million and the Colorado Department of Transportation will pay $800,000. Design work on the project will begin in the fall of 2020. Construction will begin in 2022 and end in 2023. Monthly traffic counts through Inglewood on US 285 average 64,000 cars. That number is expected to increase 30% by 2040. Currently, the corridor is prone to serious accidents involving automobiles, pedestrians, and cyclists. Since there is no pattern to the accidents and they occur throughout the entire corridor, a solution can be difficult to identify. The upcoming study will examine how to move people through the corridor more efficiently and safely. The Dr. Cog Mitigation Toolkit will be used to address congestion through various strategies. Those include active roadway management, travel demand management, alternative travel modes, and physical roadway capacity. The $200,000 Next Step Study Grant from Dr. Cog, which was awarded last year, will help ensure the City of Inglewood remains competitive in attracting and retaining employers, retailers, property owners, and residents. Among the primary tasks are planning the redevelopment of a key portion of the original 55-acre City Center Transit-Oriented Development, evaluation of the establishment of a downtown development authority for the City of Inglewood Central Business District. That includes the City Center area the historic downtown portion of South Broadway, and the medical district area. The city's two largest employers, Swedish Medical Center and Craig Hospital, continue to expand. Finally, the city will refine the original vision for the industrial portions of the Inglewood Light Rail Corridor. That includes possible rezoning to allow for a more orderly transition to other uses. This is anticipated to mirror what has happened in Denver's Rhino area. These are the next steps for the city of Inglewood. There you go. <laughs> Not bad. So I want to thank all of all of you, all of us, for the awards that we've received this year. Englewood has not received the level of support in the past financially. And I know that each of our cities um, depends on other cities to do their work on things. And Englewood is one of those that's a pass through and we have difficulties because of that. And I, I think that some of the projects we are funding are, this term round are really going to be helpful to everyone overall. And I hope it will renew just the whole um, feel for Englewood. Uh, in making it look better and feel better, a more pleasant experience, whether you drive through or stop downtown. So thank you very much. And I'm open for questions if you have any. Questions? Oh, we got a whole bunch. We'll start oh with uh, Dr. Maurer. <laughs> Good presentation. Um, oh, thank you. And I love your city. And you what? And I love your city. Thank you. The downtown is really fun right now. It's really, really transforming. So when you're doing the work at 285 and Broadway there, and it sounds like you're going to add another lane going westbound. Well, they're doing a study first, and they are going to try and expand. And we have some homeowners, actually. You don't think of that as having small homes, but we do have some. So we're, we're, there's some very specific areas that are going to be problematic for us. Yeah. And and it's going to that whole thing is going to be all the way out to the west end, and then it stops at... University. We wish it would go all the way through by Cherry Hills, Cherry Hills tried, and Denver, but it, we couldn't get um, some of the other people to agree to go that far to I tw I-25, which it really needs to be done all the way to I-25. Yeah. Dr. Elrod. Um, I caught that you have a DDA, so is it already in place or you're oh, working on it? We're working on one right now. Yeah, we're doing a lot of groundwork for it. There's, uh, at first, there were very, very nervous uh, business owners because we used to have a bid downtown that fell apart, became really caustic, actually. I sat on it for a few years. I've never been called names except there where they called me a cockroach. And <laughs> so, so we're going to be overcoming. We were overcoming that, and they're getting to be really positive about it now. So I think it'll happen, but it's going to take a year, year and a half. What the, was the shift in positivity towards it? New uh, landowners and businesses, and they're convincing others that it's worth it. And they didn't know what a TIF was when they understood what it might be. We've never done one before. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Any, yeah. other, any other questions? Yes, Director Flynn. 
Thank you, Mayor. If, if you can, can you tell us how the art shuttle is performing and is that going to be long term? Oh, it, it, we've had uh, a circulator bus. Many of you maybe you don't know about it, but it's RTD, a shared um, ride uh, and paid for by both of us. We pay a small fare, and RTD has been wonderful. And it's free to everyone, and we will continue that. We did play around last year with expanding the hours. Uh, just another hour, so we're trying to hit the shifts of Swedish and Craig Hospital a bit, but it didn't uh, net any more ridership. So we've gone back to the original. The money was not, you know, so it was good to try and pilot it, uh, but we're trying to figure out better ways for Swedish and Craig to use it because it's a really important network from the light rail over to the hospital district, which is where I live. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Thank you, everybody. I'm sure you want to get on to the, is it Jefferson? No. Adam? Uh, Douglas. Douglas. Count. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> It'd be like the world of Libby, you know. Um, now we're moving right along to the county of Douglas. Very Richard well. Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for the opportunity to give some of the highlights of Douglas County. So it's really uh, appreciate that opportunity. And let's see, where are we starting here? Not from the beginning. Nope, still not the beginning. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Great, thank you. And just hit the arrow. Yeah. Okay. Great. Appreciate the opportunity. As we know that uh, Douglas County, uh, by three commissioners, we are governed. I didn't put the pictures of three commissioners because the other two are better looking than me, so I didn't want to get upstaged on that. <laughs> and I just want to go through you know, some of the highlights, and I, not necessarily do I have that in those categories, but it's going to go quickly through those categories, and I'll just let you know, all the information statistics is solely Douglas County, even though we have municipalities. I try to make it that all the statistics that we're going to cover is for the unincorporated part of Douglas County. So just a little history on Douglas County. We were one of the 17 original counties. We were named for a uh, senator from Illinois, believe it or not. And then the county seat was originally Franktown. Then it was California Ranch. And I'm certainly glad we moved it to Castle Rock, uh, Councilman Teal, because if I was telling people our county seat is California Ranch, he'd kind of kind of look at me a little bit funny, I think. So a little bit strange. But I think what's interesting, when you look 100 years ago, we had a population of about 3,500. When we look at our population now, we are, it's not on that one, but we are now at, sorry, there it is, 370,000. So about 100 times more, if you can imagine that, 100 years, 100 times more. So uh, interesting thing here, I just want to show a little bit about the demographics, 843 square miles. And to put that perspective for you football fans, that's equivalent to 7,121,664 football fields, just so you know. I always want to make that analogy. Now, what really is interesting, though, we really value the open space, and it's really interesting. You can see the gray areas on the map are the, uh, the uh, populated areas. So 91% of the population in Douglas County lives on 18% of the land. We have five fully incorporated municipalities, the first five, and that's their population rates. And then we have parts of Aurora and Littleton also in Douglas County. When you look at what is unincorporated, we like to know the unincorporated is about 206,000. That makes Douglas County the fifth largest jurisdiction in the state behind Denver, Aurora, Colorado Springs, Jeff, unincorporated Jefferson County, and unincorporated Douglas County. So no doubt it leaves us with a great challenge with, with the three commissioners. And as some of you, no doubt, uh, provide some of these services, and we have somewhere around, and I've heard over 3,000 special districts in the state, we have 280 special districts. But we really are fortunate because we know that's, even though they've kind of got a bad rep through the Denver Post lately, they provide so much service, as we all know, as we know those districts that they do serve. Give you an idea just on the amount of lane miles we have. Again, this is just unincorporated Douglas County. The 1863, and then we still have 585 
miles of gravel. But we have a program every, every year that we are eliminating and knocking down that gravel, pro, the gravel roads just because we know, certainly because of convenience, but also because air quality. Just a, little, just a quick thing, we all have businesses, but we're very fortunate to have three of the 10 uh, top 500, Fortune 500 companies headquartered in Douglas County. We're very fortunate with that. Creates got a great employee base, but certainly a great uh, salary base, but also good companies to work for. So we're very fortunate that way. This one I'm gonna go through quick, don't read that. I just wanna point out, because we wanna make sure we have a very, I'm gonna move it now so you didn't see all that. <laughs> but what I want you to know, what you saw in the yellow was, uh, there it is, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because we value the, the conservative approach that what that said that each Douglas County employee serves about 161 residents. So you can see the others again, we're not gonna point out. <laughs> but that just shows you no, you know, no, I get yelled at. <laughs> But we make that point to our employees that, no doubt, we expect a lot out of them, but you know what? The taxpayers expect a lot out of our employees, so we really value that, so that we try to work on a limited government basis. Oop, I'm sorry. This gives you an idea of our core priorities for our budget. We have about a $463 million budget we approved, and you can see the two main areas, public safety, the dark brown, as we look at it, public safety, I believe, is probably one of the most important things of government. Because if you do not have a safe home, safe streets, safe schools, safe business, you start to lose business, you start to lose population, you certainly then, it's unsafe neighborhoods, we look at it that way. And in our other big priority is transportation, no doubt, 49%. We're very fortunate, we have a, probably one of the highest mill levies at 4.5 mills out of our roughly 20 mills goes directly to transportation and then I'll bring it up here later about our sales tax. But we value that, we know all the citizens value that. Again, one of our key things we are to do, I believe, is government. And here we are, Dr. Cog, what is one of our primary roles, transportation. They, and we're very pleased that we have no general obligation debt and we have no outstanding COPs. What we do have is citizen approved, voter approved debt for open space, which will actually expire at the end of 2023. So 2023, we will be debt free. Certainly, we value that. I actually have two of the commissioners that value that too, so that we are minimizing interest paid because we want those dollars to go right to services directly. Just gives you an idea how much we value. It is, we know air quality is such a key thing for us. We're seeing a be a non-attainment area, but I think it, it points to the importance that we see uh, electric vehicles or hybrid type vehicles. Now, uh, and uh, Commissioner Jones and I have talked about this because Boulder is very high, but you know, we're fortunate because it's a higher income level because it costs to buy these electric vehicles. So there is a, some reason. It doesn't mean we're always so, uh, environmentally conscious, which we believe we are, but this just shows that it's not an easy thing to attain, but I'd very be pleased to see that we do have a lot of that in our community. And everything we value is certainly open space, so you know that 47% of our county is dedicated to the open space and other protected land. Again, that very big, important part, what do you hear that from a quality of life, your citizens? Certainly want a job, we're gonna have a good, safe place to live, but we wanna have that open space. We really value that. We're fortunate we have about a quarter of our uh, uh, county is national forest, the Pike National Forest. And just the numbers, 63,000 acres of protected lands and open space. And then you look down 90 miles of public trails and 168 lane miles of bike lane. Again, this is just the unincorporated part because we know the, the incorporated cities in our county provide a lot of the bike lanes and trails too. So this is one thing we we're very pleased. I think we might have been, if not the only, one of the few that was able to get a transportation ballot issue across. As we know, all of us are set to challenge with that. But we certainly did our surveys, did our homework, and we definitely had the buy-in from the opposition we knew it was gonna be within our own public safety department because we did this without a tax increase. We were able to convince the citizens. We had, over the years, been able to 
uh, fund balance a large amount of $36 million into public safety. So we convinced them if we can now transfer that to transportation, we're gonna be able to bring about 13 more million dollars to serve, not just unincorporated, but also with our partners, our incorporated partners, and that's value because as we know it, every citizen in Douglas County, whether it's incorporated, uncorporated, is a county resident. So we wanna make sure that we are a very good partner. So we're very fortunate to have that. And just give you an idea that that allowed us to put to the GAP project 10 million, which is, that's what you have to do to be able to get those CDOT projects anymore is come to the table with something. And even on the federal level, the total amount for that GAP project, it was uh, only 18% federally funded. So that's, that's what we're hearing coming out of DC. It's very difficult for us all, you know, but we've got to be able to bring that money to the table. So we are fortunate our citizens approved at 5248. I just want to bring this up uh, to RTD. Thank you, Bill, for everything. Now, we hear about that, uh, not to hand, uh, hit on RTD because we know the challenges of immense are, are, are massive for you, no doubt. But in Douglas County, we only have three and a half miles of RTD. So I appreciate Central and Northern are challenged, but I think we all are. But we're very fortunate for that, and it's a high ridership, and it I believe it is totally incorporated Lone Tree, all of our three and a half miles. Sorry, Doug, none in Castle Pines. <laughs> Some of the accomplishments we really are fortunate is this was a very big decision that we went together with Aurora and Arapahoe County to do a partnership on a crime lab. Very, very important because we were able to do DNA in our county now for all these jurisdictions. And if you might have caught this in the news in December, there was a 40 year old case that was solved. It was a perpetrator that went down to Florida to actually grab this guy. 40 year old case of a murder. And I believe she might have even been murdered in Inglewood if I, it was just a shame short for a radio station. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's what it was, thank you. So it, you just really look at it. Uh, there was DNA collection 40 years ago when they didn't even know they were going to have that technology available. So I just want to really look at the importance. It was a big ask for us because we did the initial building of it and it's been about 18 million for the county. But again, we are very fortunate. Our citizens recognize public safety and we're able to put that building. Arapahoe County and Aurora are bringing the staff and equipment. It's a big lift, no doubt, but we certainly are able to, to get evidence through the door faster, through and out the door faster. Another big accomplishment was our, the public safety driving track, because it was a big challenge, no doubt, for law enforcement to be able to know how to handle the cars in situations. So we were able to provide this, but the big key, what the impetus was, was 50% donation from a very large donor to push this through for us. So, Roughly a $6 million project turned into a $3 million project. And then shortly after it was completed, thank you to CDOT, they said, well, you've got a great situation there. You're only one of two of these tracks in the country. We realize there's safety for CDOT drivers, tow truck drivers, and all first responders. So it was that Traffic Incident Management Training Center of the Thames. And I know CDOT presented that to us a couple of years ago, but we're very fortunate to have that type of a, a setting there too. And this is regarding our open space and just what we've been able to provide just in the last couple of years. And our real gem was Sandstone Ranch. This was a property listed originally, 27 and a half million. They dropped the price down. We actually end up getting it for 18,750 because the owners of it wanted it to go to a county. It actually was uh, uh, scheduled to have, I think 117 lots on it. Though of course now there's no lots and we're going through a whole master plan to be able to have a public use of this. So it's a great project. Also, we've been able to use medication credits for Chatfield Reservoir is now gonna be raised 12 feet. They needed mitigation, mitigation credits for migratory birds. We're working with the Army Corps of Engineers. We'll actually receive $6 million from the Chatfield uh, group on filling the reservoir back for those medication credits. And then we've also received a three and a half million dollar GOCO grant. So really we were able to purchase this property for about $9 million. And it's a, just a gorgeous gem down on the 
southwest part of our county. We are also actually donated this property, 520 acres, again, on the west side of the county. Very fortunate. Yeah, that'll be probably no public use because it's mitigation credits and it's a very difficult terrain. And then a, a, a working with a developer who down zoned and said, I will donate land to you if you w work with us, take it as, over, as open space. So it's another 412. So we're very pleased and fortunate to be able to have that. Another thing we've really looked at, we all know the mental health issue that is really binding a lot of us. So we have created this community response team. And on that, you have three, law enforcement, paramedic, and a caseworker, because we know whenever there is a situation, somebody calls 911, I don't know what's wrong with this person, and you need somebody there, 911 would come out, you know, so our law enforcement would come. A lot of the times, they didn't know how to handle it. The beauty of that, in the two years that we've had this going, not one time has there been an individual jailed. They're usually either taken care of in a follow-up case, or they're taken to a mentalist hospital. And also the hospitals, just in the first year, the hospitals recognized over a million dollars saving through the ER visits. Because they go to the ER and a lot of times the doctors are trained. We don't really want to do with this person. So they are either admitted or incarcerated. So we've been able to eliminate a lot of that through this. It's really been a success. But I know a lot of us are working on certain things. And it's it's not a it's a costly thing. The first year is about six hundred thousand. We have now added a youth CRT team. So we're up to a little over a million. And that youth CRT team was our reaction to the STEM school shooting we had. So this is a team that is only for the ages of 5 to 19. And so it's amazing how many times they get calls to go to the schools. It's, it's sad, but we're able to eliminate a lot of those key issues. And I also say, I think Lone Tree, Parker, Cass Rock have been great partners in that too. So just a couple of the highlights is we were named the health, last year the healthiest county in the country. So we feel very fortunate of that. And you know, a lot of that, it's not we, the government, that's doing that. That's our residents. So we're very fortunate they're very health conscious and they do really care about it. So that's just one of our highlights. But I do also want to point on the other side, very sad thing is, and we all know the vaping issue, we have a very high vaping problem in our youth in Douglas County. So it's kind of odd. How can you be the healthiest county but have one of the highest youth vaping uh, statistics? So we're not sure really what's going on there, but it certainly is a big concern, which we will be working on more and more. So that's the first one talking about the vaping. Very, we're very pleased to report that we have the lowest poverty rate for under 18 in the country. Again, that's not because of government, it's really because of the action of people, and the big part is our faith-based initiatives, and it's really a lot of the churches that take this over. We have a churches that actually create a, what we call a winter shelter network. So every night through roughly November to March, there is one church that'll take anybody in for the evening and provide a meal. If it's a female, if it's female with children, if it's a male, we put them up, you know, or actually I should say the church puts them up in a motel, hotel. So we look at that. It's really a lot of the volunteer base that takes care of that situation of homelessness or poverty. And then uh, just a couple of the awards from our, I always like to mention because as we know, our staffs are the subject matter experts. So certainly our finance department has done wonderful with the uh, transparency and our website, just like to point that out. And then as I end up, just a couple of very uh, interesting facts, is Douglas County is actually the owner of two cattle brands, the JR, which uh, was out of the ranch, the Prairie Canyon Ranch on the south, west side of the county, east side of the county, and then that's our new brand we created for our sandstone herd, the, the Rockin' DC brand. And then one of the last things, not on there, but it was on there. We are actually the owners of a cemetery because in Douglas County, we want to know where the dead are buried. So just so you know that. <laughs> now, is if you have any reservations for August 1st, 2020, I want you to cancel those right now because you have the opportunity, and I can't get it to advance, you have the opportunity to see 83-year-old Charlie Daniels at the Douglas County Fair. So get your tickets early. Thank you, everyone. Any questions?
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Was there any questions for Douglas County? Uh, director. All right, moving, oh, you know what? We're gonna pick another community spotlight, but next month we're only gonna do one because we'll have an agenda probably to hear what our legislators are doing. Um, so we picked Glenda. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, all right. You're in the center of the universe. You should come and tell us all about it. Um, and then also I wanna recognize uh, State Representative Malika, who is here in the back. We brought, we brought Council Member Malika up here to the front because we have to watch her. <laughs> so she's sitting up front with us. So welcome, Representative. Uh, moving right along, reports from the chair. So reports, I don't have anything to report. I do have one more month. So those that were excited and you all showed up for my party, <laughs> let's do it again next month because I think this is probably the largest group together because I haven't seen an extra table be brought up in a long time. So I applaud you all to come down here and I know it's a journey and it's a lot of work and it's, it's important work. So thank you for our, everyone's attendance. So moving right along to the reports on performance and engagement committee, that is Director Stolzman? We didn't meet. Okay. <laughs> was you, oh, you didn't meet, well that was easy. Uh, dire, dire, <laughs> next one up is Finance and Budget Committee, Director Flynn. Thank you, we did meet. And we uh, authorized the Executive Director to um, add on uh, an additional $103,000 to the Ride Alliance Trip Exchange Program, the pilot that's gonna start in March. Uh, we're adding some enhancements, uh, some functionality enhancements to the, this is the, uh, the hub that's going to allow our, our ride providers to go to a common source to serve clients and to better track uh, trips and finances and et cetera. And so we'll see that next month. Did I do that accurately, Doug and, and uh, Jayla? Yes, sir. Thank you. And then the second item was to increase the compensation limits for our contracted uh, rides, the uh, AAA voucher program. This has been highly successful, and so we need to add some uh, allocation from uh, currently unallocated state funds. I believe that the number of trips already booked for uh, January was exceeded 700, uh, and uh, we did over 500 in the month of December, and so we're keeping track of, of this uh, success through the end of the state fiscal year in June. And, uh, and we had a small discussion about what happens if it actually runs out of money, if it continues to grow. And so we'll deal with that when we, when we get to it. It's nice to have a successful program like that, but we, don't, we wanna keep it going. Uh, so we hope that we're not running out before the end of the fiscal year, June 30th. And that's all. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, next up, report of the Executive Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a few things for you this evening. First of all, it's my, my monthly cry for, uh, to mark your calendars on April 22nd is our annual award celebration. I, I hope everybody plans to attend. This is your event, and uh, so we really wanna have great attendance for that. Um, there's only two days left to, um, uh, to, to pass in your nominations for various awards, the two main categories being the Metrovision Awards, which celebrates projects, people, and initiatives um, for in, within your own communities that are implemented to make this uh, the, the great place that it is, and the John B. Christensen, Christensen Award, which is um, named after a former Arapahoe County Commissioner, and that's our most prestigious award. And then, as most of you guys know, uh, former Mayor of Centennial, uh, Kathy Noon, won that award last year. So please, if you have, you have uh, people that you think or projects that you feel are appropriate, um, we would love to have those nominations. So get them in, it's easy to fill out. You can do it all online, um, but I would strongly encourage you to do so. Um, I also wanted to let you know about an upcoming event um, as Dr. Cog Day at the Capitol. It is on Friday, February 7th from 7.30 to 9. Um, it's, it, and it's truly an opportunity for us to just share Dr. Cog's program with, with, uh, with the members of the General Assembly at the Capitol. We'll be sending out some additional information to you all, um, so hopefully you'll be able to attend that. Just drop by, I know, I know it's early in the morning on a Friday, but um, we, hope, uh, we hope we can get some participation and give you an opportunity to talk to, to uh, some of our legislators. Um, we'll be serving a light breakfast there, and, and, uh, and uh, we're really looking forward to engaging our state leaders. 
Um, on January 9th, Dr. Cog hosted our fifth and final s installment of Imagine a Great Region. Um, over the past, past year, we've been partnering with CU Denver to offer uh, our existing MetroVision Idea Exchanges program to assist the university in convening st uh, key stakeholders to discuss how the region's economic growth can, can be uh, more sustainable and equitable. During the uh, January session, participants learned about learned about and provided feedback on Prosper Colorado, uh, which is an initiative of the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, the Denver Leadership Foundation, and, and uh, Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation. Um, Prosper Colorado is working to ensure that everyone in Colorado has a path to economic uh, opportunities afforded to residents of our great region and state. So um, we we're, we were very happy to participate in that um, in partnership with CU Denver. I think it was quite successful. And speaking of our uh, idea exchanges, we do not only do we have in-person exchanges, but we also do these virtual ones. And I would strongly encourage you guys, if you can just jump on for an hour or so to participate in those. We've, we've had a, a lot of su success with those. Um, uh, we had, we had oh, nearly 600 registrants um, for the six remote idea exchanges that we did in 2019. So please look out for that. Our next one is going to be January 30th. And we're offering this in, in partnership with the Urban Land Institute. And um, again, it's going to be on, on the 30th. And it will actually include a presentation by our very own director, Kevin Flynn. I will, I'll leave you. Oh. Ah. <laughs> I won't share exactly what he's going to talk about. No, but that, that, that's pretty cool. We appreciate you doing that, uh, Director Flynn. Um, let me see here. Also, at, uh, f during that event, we're going to be we're going to be um, announcing the um, ULI Technical Advisory Panels. Um, we 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 partner with ULI and we provide some funding in order to do these 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 taps. Uh, I who did we do last time? It was Castle Pines and Evergreen. Very and Evergreen last year. I know we did Castle Pines before, right? Um, so, so that's pretty cool. So we'll be sending out some additional information to you all, for, and hopefully, um, if if you feel if if uh, you feel this is worthwhile, that you would apply, and and uh, we hope we'll get enough applicants to fill at least those two. Uh, last but not least, I just wanted to mention that on Monday, the National Association of City Transportation Officials (NACO). Um, they elected our uh, Ulysses Cleckley, who is the executive director of the Denver Department of Transportation Infrastructure, as the board's vice chair. So that was pretty cool. It just speaks to the transportation professionalism and leadership that we have in this region. So please thank, thank Ulysses on behalf of the board. Mr. Chairman, that is my report. Thank you. Any questions for Doug? Um, let's keep on cruising. Next up is Public comment, up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are any additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to uh, complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comments on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately. Uh, speaker, is there anyone who would like to speak in public comment? Yes. Representative Mullica. Can we just blame your wife for anything you may say to us? Yes, you can. <laughs> um, just a couple of things. I just want to say that I miss you all. We miss uh, you. Coming to these meetings and uh, seeing all the amazing work that you're doing. I just want to say thank you. Um, and then I wanted to also see, is it all right if I can just give my wife keys real quick? I came down here just to <laughs> trade out cars. I have to go so, pick up the so, kids. So, so we is can't that, blame her. Is, can I approach yeah, she, we've, the dais? I'm not quite sure what your rules are. No, you are. can come right through the center, but we've allocated 45 minutes for you to do that. So. <laughs> I thought you might be proposing again to her or something. Just thank you for all that you do. No, thank you very much. Thank you for what you do for us. <laughs> <laughs> that is on public record, yes. <laughs> well, that's a first for me to have a public comment like that. Can I bring you keys? Yeah. Oh, it's on T. Yeah, it's on TV. <laughs> that's what happens. Okay, that threw me. All right, let's get back on track here. All right, item number nine on your uh, it's the consent agenda. 
Uh, I'm looking for uh, a motion to approve the consent agenda. All right, those all in favor say aye. aye. Op opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that carries. So we'll keep moving on to the action items, item number 10. Uh, discussion of state legislative issues, new bills for consideration and action. It's attachment D in your packet, and Mr. Morrow, the uh, senior policy and legislative analyst is here to speak to the board. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I just might point out that um, we we uh, we mailed out to you guys on Monday the a list of seven or I think it was seven seven or eight bills for for your consideration this evening. So there, those are also at your seats. Thank you, thank you. And uh, we've got I think six bills to talk to you about and a few other things. So I'd like to, to uh, see if we could take just a couple of minutes. Uh, to uh, at the beginning, uh, again, to introduce our lobbyists, uh, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle, and ask them to make a couple of uh, introductory remarks regarding the uh, beginning of the session and kind of an overview of the uh, state budget picture, and then um, we'll get into the uh, list of bills. Sounds good. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Castle, um, and Ed Bowditch. Uh, we we very much enjoy representing Dr. Cog down at the Capitol, so thank you very much for that honor. So the legislative session started last Wednesday, January 8th. They will be in session for up to 120 days per the Constitution. They can always cut that short, but of course they never do. So we'll go until about May 6th. Those are fine. Um, That's what this is. So far, the first couple of days, the first week or so, we have been hearing speeches from leaders, from the um, President of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, and the Governor's <laughs> office. Um, in addition, de state departments have been making presentations to legislative committees on their legislative priorities and agendas and some of their strategic goals as well, too. So not too much has been happening down at the Capitol right now. There is a lot of excitement. Everybody is happy to be back in the Capitol. I don't know how long that will last. We'll see. Ed and I, at least we're still smiling. Are you smiling? Yes, there we go. Smiling. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, next week, we will start seeing some debate on bills. So things will start moving come next week. So far, as of this evening, 255 bills have been introduced. We are expected to see anywhere from 600 to 700. Last year, we saw about 800, um, but we are expecting to see a little bit less this year. Those first few bills that are introduced in the House and the Senate usually signal the priorities of the chambers. So the first couple of bills that have been introduced are signaling, signaling to us that the legislative priorities of the legislature include behavioral health services, increasing the age for, um, for anyone using nicotine from 18 to 21, and rural economic development. And um, greetings, Ed Bowditch. Again, thank you for the opportunity to continue to represent Dr. Cog. Oftentimes what happens in the legislature is uh, defined by what happens for the legislature. You all know in the results of the November election, Prop CC failed the effort to allow the, cape, the state to keep all of its tax revenue that collects. That failed. On December 20th, the state received its revenue estimates. At that time, the state economists um, reported that the state's economy is still quite healthy. There are a lot of things to be proud about. Um, since September, between September and December, the state's general fund revenue collection increased um, by about $166 million. The flip side, the state's Tabor refund requirement increased by $224 million. So while more money was coming in, even more money is required to go out. Good news when you do your taxes, there'll be a temporary income state tax reduction um, this spring to account for the Tabor refund. Um, if you would like to see more of those dollars going to other services, well, at this point, they're going to be Tabor refunds. So that, that sets the tone for the budget discussions it is still a positive budget year, just not as positive as prior years. Rich, back to you. All right, thank you. So uh, let's start on the matrix that you should have. Uh, we've got three bills on aging issues and three bills on transportation issues. And um, during the, when we get to, the, to those categories there will be a couple other things that we're hearing about that we'll give you some previews of but so first of all um, and I'll try to do a quick um, description of the bills 
and then open it up to the board. Uh, there, there, you'll see that there's a staff recommendation. In some cases, that's just to monitor or we're just asking the board for direction. In some cases, we make a, a recommendation to support. And um, so the first bill is House Bill 1009, which uh, the, the short title, as you can see, is Suppressing Court Records of Eviction Proceedings. So this is a bill that comes under that category of, of several bills we saw last year uh, on uh, renters' rights and um, uh, protections to help lower, uh, largely <laughs> oftentimes lower income residents to be able to uh, maintain uh, some affordable housing and, and some stable housing. Uh, the board uh, supported a bill last year that um, set up a legal defense fund uh, for renters in eviction cases. I see this one as somewhat of a, a follow-up kind of bill. What it does is, under current law, if there's eviction proceeding against someone and that eviction proceeding ends up not going forward, getting dismissed, et cetera, um, it's still a public record. So if that tenant sometime down the road moves and applies uh, for another apartment and landlord does background checks and, and those kinds of things, uh, it could turn up that they would see that there had been an eviction proceeding and could use that against the uh, taking the application from the person, even though the eviction proceeding never went forward. So what this bill does is says only in those cases where the, the eviction actually was dismissed and nothing happened, that record of that in the future would be suppressed. Um, and so in the, uh, on the basis of helping folks be able to continue to find uh, supportable or, or stable and uh, uh, supportive housing, uh, the staff has decided to make a recommendation to the board that we support that bill. Any questions on this bill? Uh, Director Adjutson. Not necessarily a question, but Part of what this led into from last year is uh, Adams County with Eva and myself and some of the other municipalities, we created a legal group to go to court to head off some of this from that's going on that's talked about in the bill today. Because it was having an impact, as uh, Rich talked about, on people being able to get an application through on a, on a apartment they wanted to rent because there was some outstanding piece that had been dismissed by the court but was still out there and then we're using it again. But also we have part of the fund that we deal with these is that we also have people at court every day looking for these type of cases coming through where they don't have representation and then our attorneys are pulling those people aside and saying you you have representation if you're here in Adams County or, or Westminster we do it for both counties. But well, this piece I think is a good companion piece to keep that going. Recommend some. Rich, are you looking for? So are we going to go through all six of these and then look for some board action? Um, yeah, let's just take them one at a time. I think right okay, now. But, it, I, but you're so looking for I'd look action. for a motion. Motion, yes. So I look for uh, a motion uh, on this bill, which is what ten ten oh nine. You have the you have the motion. You need the second. Uh, in support of. Okay. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? No. Abstention? Carries. <laughs> next up. Uh, next one is uh, Senate Bill 30. Uh, the short title is Consumer Protections for Utility Customers. It'll need a little bit of explanation. And actually, I'm going to say that the, the staff, uh, we put, that, put it down for a recommendation to monitor be, when this went out because we had just seen the bill and kind of thought we knew what it was about, but was it 100% sure? So um, in the meantime, we uh, have had, a, I have had an opportunity to talk to proponents and, and some others about what this bill is about. And, and I'll explain on that basis why the staff would like to actually recommend that the board support this bill. Um, and, but, but let me explain real quick. So uh, a number of years ago, legislature had uh, passed a bill to dealing with an issue where cases where uh, the utility would could shut off a person's power for non-payment and so on and so forth, but directing the, the Public Utility Commission to do some rulemaking 
to create exemptions for, for people who need to have their power stay on to operate life-saving equipment. So somebody who'd be on respirators or uh, older adults or di persons with disabilities and so forth that would need to have their electricity continue to run. And um, so, and I remember, Jayla, I think, didn't you even testify at the PUC uh, during that time? We'd both been around long enough. That <laughs> um, and so what I found out uh, what this, where this bill's coming from is essentially um, an attempt to update Colorado statutes and direct the PUC to update their rulemaking to um, address the advances that we've seen in technology where uh, the utility and so forth are able to uh, quickly shut people's equipment off or power off remotely. And it, I guess it's also related to like Excel switching over to uh, the new uh, meters and so forth. And, th and there's a, a few other pieces to it. But basically it's, it's, it's the same uh, legislation and codifying the same practices that we are and protections that we have now but trying to make it uh, clear for the PUC to update their their rulemaking to address these new technologies and so on that basis since it supports something that we've already supported in the past and would would uh, um, uh, provide additional protections for uh, older adults that we ad advocate for. We'd, we'd appreciate if the board would support the bill. Okay, so it says monitor on our sheet, but you're asking for support. Yes, yes. Okay. I have a, a motion to support. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Yes. Mr. Chair, I, I'm sorry to ask a question after the vote. <coughs> I have a question about the bill. <coughs> um, Nied. <laughs> that's, fine. That, that, that's fine. I'll bring it up next meeting when no. they haven't voted on it yet. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, Director <laughs> Stoltzman. Uh, my question is, you, um, Mr. Morrow, you brought up the, the um, well, first of all, my city doesn't have a position on this bill, so I abstain from voting. Um, but I, I have a question about the meters that you talked about. There is some controversy around the monopoles that Excel's installing to read the new meters. Um, they're very tall, and they are putting them all over the place. So, like They're over 200 feet in some places, so that does add some additional controversy in the different cities. So I wonder if in supporting this bill, we, we're supporting implementing technology that requires these towers? I don't think so, but I will in the meantime double check on that and, and promise to report back to you about that issue. You bring a good point, but I think the towers would be regulated by your ordinances because FCC doesn't, it, it, uh, shouldn't be weighing in on those. It, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> well, okay. Okay, we'll, we'll check on it. Okay, so then the next one onto the page two is Senate Bill 33. Um, and actually, uh, if you got questions, I'm gonna have Ed ask, ask him because he was involved in a previous bill. A number of years ago, uh, the legislature uh, passed uh, legislation to um, allow what they call Medicaid buy-in, in this case for um, persons with disabilities of working age, so that um, they could continue to work and retain their income, not have to do the spend down and only only have $2,000 worth of assets, uh, otherwise lose their life-saving Medicaid uh, health care, uh, but that they'd be able to work and then pay premiums to Medicaid in order to, to uh, stay on the program. And so that's been in effect for a number of years. And what they have found, not surprisingly, is a lot of, the, a lot of folks are aging out of the program. The program was initially created for, like I said, like, you know, 21 to age 65, I think. And so a number of these folks have got, are, are, are starting to get over 65, uh, but still able to work a little bit to the point where if they're no, no longer included in the law, they'd have to go through the, the Medicaid spend down and so forth. And so, um, it, this is really coming from the disability community, but obviously uh, Dr. Cog is an ADRC, uh, serves people with disabilities, and, and this is focused on those that are reaching uh, the, the over 65 age. And the idea really is to be able to keep those folks 
um, being able to continue to work and be productive members living in the community and so forth and uh, delay any time by which they'd have to go on even more uh, government programs. And so we're asking the board uh, to support uh, this bill. Any questions on this bill? And I look for our motion and support. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Thank you. All right. Uh, before we move on to transportation, um, I did want to mention, and I don't know if Ed wanna, and Jen want to jump in, but we, we have found out that um, we've, pro we've had conversations at uh, this meeting in the past over legislators being interested in making changes to the senior property tax exemption. Uh, it's been a, uh, an issue for a number of years now with uh, the cost of the state, to the state, of reimbursing local governments for the lost property taxes from that exemption has just been going up and up uh, to the point where I think current estimates are somewhere in the vicinity of $150 million a year that the state has to pay out for that. Um, in, in over the last three years, I think, in particular, uh, Representative Chris Kennedy has really taken this issue on and tried to look at a number of different options uh, for addressing a number of the issues with that. And um, we, we, he's introduced bills, had them uh, delayed and so forth, and he's had lots of stakeholder meetings. He's done that again this year, and we've, we've heard that he is planning uh, to introduce another bill that would essentially be uh, an income tax credit, but it would also, and I'm not sure how it works yet because I haven't seen the language, and I don't know, Jen, if you can explain it, but it would still somehow be tied to uh, a person's um, the amount that they spend on their housing as compared to their income. And so there would still be kind of a threshold by wh that would determine um, who would qualify. And, it, and I think it, the idea is that it would enable uh, the state to target that benefit uh, to, to those of lower income. And Jen, tell me if I'm wrong on that, Ned. Um, yes, that's, that's basically the framework, but the bill has not yet been introduced. So we really don't have a lot more details than that. But it will be something that would be a priority item for Dr. Cog to review. So once it's introduced, we will bring it to the board at that point. Okay. Thank you. Okay, on the transportation bills, we got three of those. And um, do we have four? Four. Okay. That's right, I forgot about the first one. <laughs> uh, the first one, we. Uh, um, it's up to the board. We're just asking you to monitor at this point. Um, but, to, but we wanted to bring this bill to your attention since I know everybody here is uh, interested in the workings of the uh, HPTE. Uh, this bill uh, basically requires additional, various different additional reporting uh, that the HPTE is supposed to do. And um, just wanted to make sure you're aware of it. it obviously, if, if the board wants to take a position on it, uh, you're welcome to do so, but the staff's not necessarily recommending one way or the uh, another. Questions on this one? <coughs> yes, Director Atchison. Uh, I think this thing quite a bit more than a couple of weeks. I would probably going to still don't have the legislative policy input. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, the next one, the next one. I, well, do we oh, need to do sorry. a motion on monitor? Taking your position? Yeah, yeah, we should, have, we should have a motion. It. All right, we'll take the motion to yeah, monitor. In order to get it on the list. Second. Sorry. Those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? <laughs> Abstentions. <laughs> okay, so the next one. We did. Oh, they <laughs> the next one um, is, uh, and some of you may have already heard about this bill, but um, uh, it's described. It's it, the title: is Sales and Use Tax Revenues for Transportation. It is essentially 
maybe not exactly, but essentially a return of Senate Bill 1 from 1997 that, is, that also had about 10% of the net sales and use tax revenues allocated directly to the HUTF and um, allocated you know, by, to the state and uh, counties and municipalities. This one, I don't remember if the first one used the second tier formula, but this, this one does. And um, that's basically what it does. Um, at this point, with all the other conversations about funding for transportation, the various uh, ideas that are being thrown about and other bills that we're all expecting, uh, at this point, staff is, is just uh, asking the board for direction, what you want to do, if you want to just put it on the list and monitor it for now, or if the board has strong feelings one way or another. Any uh, discussion or comments? Director Teal. Thank you, Chairman. Well, uh, I mean, I would recommend at the very least, I would recommend that we actually um, make a motion to support this. Uh, I can understand the nature of the discussion. And so at the very least, I would recommend that we actually motion to monitor, even though, uh, and thanks, Rich, for pointing out it was 97-001. That was the last time we saw this. Actually, guys, this reflects the historic uh, funding of transportation here in the state of Colorado really going back from, um, uh, really from 2009 to the 1930s. So considering all the discussions that we have had over the last several years at the state level, at the state legislature, I mean, I would hate to see us uh, take a motion to oppose this because history-wise has taught us that this has been a winning formula for funding transportation in the state of Colorado for the lion's share of the history of the state. Chairman, I submit, I yield back to you for further discussion. Uh, Thank you, Director Till. Director Brockett. So is it correct that, that the bill would, it would dedicate a certain percentage of funding to transportation, but without adding additional revenue, right? So then that would it be a true statement to say that it would be likely to force cuts in other programs, including potentially some that Dr. Cog supports? We've had that conver that kind of conversation in the past, uh, because it, it, it essentially by taxing uh, or di diverting 10% of the sales tax revenues, that money would have otherwise gone into the general fund. And um, uh, Doug and I were talking about this earlier. I, uh, off the top of my head, estimated at probably somewhere around $200 million a year based on current uh, sales and use tax revenues to the state. Um, but yeah, that's money that would otherwise go into the general fund and uh, presumably uh, could be used for other things like funding for senior services. I guess just based on that, I mean, I'm fine with monitoring it, but I'd, I'd be inclined to not support it based on the potential danger to other priorities that we support. Thank you, Director Brockett. Director Jones. Um, I would agree. I, this is not something we would support. I'm okay with monitoring. I'm looking at the sp the double R sponsorship and would would guess that this bill is not likely to move anywhere. Um, certainly would defer to our lobbyists, but I, I look at it as sort of a symbolic bill, so it's certainly not worth us spending a whole lot of time on. It would be my guess, but happy to, to defer to you. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, we haven't heard that this is going to be the vehicle that moves forward. So we would agree with you. Um, may sit there for a while, we'll see. But at this point, we haven't heard that there's a lot of support for this bill. Any other discussion? Make a motion to monitor. Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Okay, that passes. Next. All right. Uh, the next bill, uh, Senate Bill 61, um, addresses an issue uh, uh, regarding uh, bicycles and bicycle lanes uh, by Senator Foote. Um, staff is recommending support based on um, uh, board policies uh, regarding uh, um, safety uh, for the traveling public and on, on the state system. And basically what this one would do was, would be to create uh, an offense, I guess it's a class one, class A traffic offense uh, for f failure, failing to yield to a bicycle, in a bicycle lane. And I, th and I think reading the bill the other day, that amounts to about a $70 fine plus a $10 surcharge. 
uh, for that type of violation. But with more bicycles on the road and in bicycle lane, and particularly with more dedicated bicycle lanes, I think that's part of what's bringing this up right now. Any discussion, Director Jones? Um, I would make a motion that we support it. I think this is in line with our Vision Zero to reduce fatalities and just clarify that bikes and bike lanes, that's where they're supposed to be, and, and so cars shouldn't be there running them over. Second. Second. Director Flynn? Question. Yes. Just for clar clarification, is there no penalty right now? Is there no statute or regulation that says uh, to motor vehicle drivers don't uh, don't fail to yield to a bike in a bike lane that's my understanding this is a new establishing a new traffic offense okay that's my understanding anyway thank you director Zabo on that was my question too yeah. uh, what happens today if on my way home I fail to yield to a bike in a bike lane? What happens to me? Yeah, I, 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 my understanding is there's no law uh, that be tied to that right now. So, just say, oh, tough luck, guy on the bike. Well, is that, I mean, I mean there's it, got it, to be some kind of well, recourse. And it's point. not talking about actually hitting somebody or having an accident. Right. This is talking simply about not yielding. Right, right. So I, there I is guess a careless right now it, there would only be something if somebody, if there's actually an incident that occurs. It is a careless driving offense if you yeah. were to hit that, that cyclist. Hit some, sure. If you hit somebody. This, yeah. But this is specifically to somebody in a bike lane, traveling in a bike lane. And, you, and you cut, like cutting them off or something. Right. Yeah. Yielding to them. Not yielding. Director Dell. I thought there had to be. You're on. I thought there had to be. You're off. I thought you had to give them three feet. Am I on? Or You're on now. I thought we had to give them three feet regardless of where they were in the road. So since you got to give them three feet, why, why limit it to the bike lane? You see a bike rider, you, you don't run over their handlebars. You give them three feet. That's what I do on 32nd Street. Out there's not three feet on 32nd Street. <laughs> That's because you're driving. You'll be in the wrong lane going the wrong way, Jim. <laughs> you both work in the same community, huh? Uh, so, uh, Director Binkley. Now I'm parent. Am I on? Okay. You're on. You're on. Don't touch um, anything. <laughs> so I am. I am pro yielding two bikes. Um, what I would also like to make sure, though, is that. We are supportive of drivers with signage and like just clear ways. Like I, I cycle and I drive in Denver and I've seen it both ways. Um, I drive a lot on Broadway and I have no idea what's happening or who's where or what's going on. So I would say if there is a law around this, then there also needs to be ways to know that that is happening. You know what I'm saying? So I just want to make sure that everybody's supported if something like that is happening. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Director Flynn. How can we work on getting people not to park in the bike lanes? Uh, <laughs> problem for us. No chance. <laughs> uh, forgot where we are. You guys, this, got, this come conversation. Oh, Good sorry. Bad. I'm Good sorry, bad. Director Jones. I just oh, you have a motion, but I don't motion. have a second yet. Second. second. All right, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Uh. All right, that, that carries. Next up. Okay, the last bill, uh, Senate Bill 67. Um, and so, it, so you know, when, when somebody buys a car, a uh, new car anyway, and the... Uh, uh, specific ownership tax is charged on, I guess, 75% of the manufacturer's suggested retail price for what is it, Class A and B vehicles, uh, or 85% of the MSRP on Class C and D vehicles. This bill would get rid of that and say this specific ownership tax is going to be based on the actual purchase price of the vehicle. Um, so we. 
at first when we saw this bill at the staff level, we were like, what, where's this coming from, et cetera, didn't, you know, didn't really know. Uh, so I just went and talked to the sponsor and, and Senator Crowder told me it was just an idea he had, that it was something that always bothered him, that um, it just never made sense to him that uh, <coughs> cars were, uh, that, that the tax was charged on the MSRP and some percentage of the MSRP and it should just be straight on the uh, purchase price. Um, and that's it. So, um, and he did admit that he hadn't seen the fiscal note yet, but he expected it probably would show a reduction in revenues from the tax. So I said, yeah, that's probably going to cause you some problems. Um, but anyway, so again, we, we just figured, and this bill's probably not going to go anywhere either, um, quite frankly. Uh, so it's probably, uh, we, staff thinks it's just better to just monitor it and not spend too much time on it. Director <laughs> Atchison. I, I, from the municipal level, it makes no sense for me to get engaged in sales tax off of vehicles anyway. What you get sales tax off of is services performed at a dealership. Oh, so we get okay. sales tax. We do. We do. Oh, well, it's a big chunk. Tax, it's a monitor for us. Tax, so yeah, most of this is going to the county and the state. And we're here, man. Yes. I understand. <laughs> so, no. so my point is, do you want to give up the tax? Oh. <laughs> and I, then I would support Mr. Morrow's point that this is a monitor thing and <laughs> not spend a lot of time because I think as soon as the state figures they're going to lose more money than they're already losing, this thing is going to die anyway. Sure. Or it's head for the Veterans <laughs> Affairs Committee. We're refunding all the money through Tabor anyway, so I don't know why we oh. keep adding to this thing. <laughs> it's in the Senate, in Senate Finance, and in the Senate, uh, Senate Finance often performs the same function as state affairs. Okay, uh, D Director Teal. So, uh, bearing, in mind, uh, <laughs> bearing in mind Director Atchison's comment about uh, municipalities uh, sometimes may or may not be collecting this tax, uh, there is a young la a, a lady named uh, Glenda Smith who is a resident of my district in Castle Rock whom has sent me approximately, just off the top of my head, about 25 emails on this very subject following her relocation to the town of Castle Rock from Nebraska, where she purchased a vehicle and is taxed uh, at a rate that's approximately, um, and this may be an exaggeration, but really around $10,000 here in the state of Colorado above the purchase price of that vehicle. Yes, I think there was a brother-in-law who was involved in the sale, <laughs> See, that's part of the issue. Son-in-law. Yeah. But the bottom line is, uh, actually, this is an issue for some, listen, this is an issue for at least one of my residents, and every time this has actually come up, this is an issue for my residents. Uh, the fact that we are not actually taxing at the actual purchase value, which we do for everything else in this state. Instead, we are taxing at MSRP. Obviously, I think Director Atchison's comments pertaining to the likely progress through the legislature is probably very salient. Once again, I would um, move that the that the board's position be to monitor. I have a motion and a second. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Abstentions. Thank you very much. That carries. Okay. So that's all I have, but I did want to just see if um, all of you are interested in just one little note about the uh, regional transportation funding bill that's been talked about. Doug's like, no, please don't. <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to uh, just uh, turn it over to Ed and Jen just for a minute. Right. Or 30 seconds, if you 30 want. 30 seconds. Can be quick. Thank you all. So the MPO legislation that we've been talking about now for several months, um, it was proposed in the Transportation Interim Committee. It has been drafted and is expected to be introduced here any day now. There's two pieces to it. It allows um, an MPO to go out to its voters to ask, to ask for a tax for transportation projects. And then it also has a hold harmless provision in there um, as it relates to CDOT um, funding projects. So we do know that there is going to be a grand bill on transportation, some sort of statewide solution to transportation. Should that fail, 
the sponsors of this legislation who are the chairs of the house and the senate transportation committees this is going to be their fix or this is what they are going to go ahead and move forward with as it relates to a transportation funding solution for the state so something for all of us to be aware in which committee was that transportation, transportation both senate and transportation. House. No, the, the, the chairs of the two transportation committees will be the sponsors oh, you so ask me to ask the question okay. so don't don't <laughs> Make look like I'm the dumb one Thanks, here. Thanks, Doug. Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer. Don't make Pfeiffer. me say it again. <laughs> hey, shh. So please all, class. Yeah, over the next month, please talk to your councils and commissions and hopefully get some direction when yes. this comes up. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Well, I, w I was just going to say, so once we get the draft language, we can send that out to everybody. Because um, yeah, it's not available yet, right? And that's the backup plan to the statewide. All right. I'm curious how that goes because I know the mayor caucus, Metro Mayor Caucus floats around that bill. So I, I want to make sure we're very close to it, I think, because it's us accountable, not the mayors over there. So let's make sure it goes to what we want. Okay. Any other questions, comments? All right, we'll move right along. Informational briefings, item number 11, solicitation of performance and engagement and finance budget and budget committee members, attachment in your packet, Mr. Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. And just real quickly, we want you uh, to serve on one of these committees if you're not already a member. Um, we serve dinner, you know, so we got that going for us. Um, and, and the two committees, I mean, we have, we have the uh, actual standing committee uh, information in here, uh, the actual, um, the bylaws or, or committee guidelines. So please review those. The budget and finance, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. Performance and engagement is a little different and is something we set up oh, three, three, year, three, four years ago now um, with the primary purpose really to help in increasing our collaboration as a board um, also, it's, it's responsible for my evaluation, but um, as well as helping us with uh, coordination and planning for the annual award celebration, as well as our annual retreat. So if you are so inclined to, uh, to want to serve on one of these, which I strongly encourage you to do so, um, we will be asking for you to submit just a, just a quick statement of interest. And um, we will be making, so the nominating committee will then meet after February 21st to make a recommendation um, in, at the March meeting, and then your your two years of service will begin in April. So thank you very much. Exciting times. So please join. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> no, it's important because when we did the governance committee, uh, I think Elise was there. I can't remember if Atchison was there, but when we had the governance, we purposely made there used to be this thing called the admin committee, if any of those know, and breaking that up into two other committees, and it increased participation because it was a little, I wouldn't say exclusive, but it was a very smaller a smaller group, and when we broke it up, it gave more opportunities for more uh, communities to participate in the governance of this organization. So I think it's very important that, uh, you know, we did, we did a lot of heavy lifting to make this happen, and uh, we'd like to fill it up and make sure that uh, all the members are participating in Yes, uh, Director Dell. Point of clarification. So, the present nominating committee this part either. So, the nominating for, uh, committee does not run for board officers. You're right. Uh, and the I don't think that's true in the case of the subcommittees. It but can't I, be on the executive committee. It can't be correct. But I don't think that's true for the subcommittees. But I will definitely confirm that. Yeah. So, Director and, and budget finance. That is true. Yes, sir. It's yep. true. Okay, good. And we'll be sending out more reminders about this. Don't worry. Do you share what the current schedule is when these two committees meet, please? Yes. Um, so the performance and engagement committee, as currently structured, meets um, immediately following the, um, the the board work session, which is the first Wednesday of the month. Now, granted, we have not. We probably only have probably six of those meetings a year. Um, so on. So those months in which we don't have a, a, um, a work session, the Performance and Engagement Committee meets at 5.30 uh, upstairs at, at, on our regular board night. So we run Performance and Engagement and then Finance and Budget, we run them uh, one after the other. All right, any other questions? 
Thank you very much. We'll move right on to item number 12, the 2050 small area forecasting process attachment F in your packet. Mr. Colvert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you're primarily going to hear from my colleague Andy Taylor, as seen on the slide here. Uh, but I did want to do a very quick sort of intro on, on this item. Uh, I have one very simplistic thing that I want to accomplish in our time tonight. When we come back to you a few more times in, in 2020 and use the term small area forecast, you kind of know what we're talking about because it's a term I've been using for 20 years and I don't think I can retrain my brain at this point to call it something different. Uh, so if we can just get to that level of understanding tonight, uh, that would be great. Uh, this is one of those items that actually is just really good timing. Uh, we had penciled this uh, briefing uh, uh, for this month, and last month at last month's meeting, Director Partridge actually asked a question about this specific product uh, that we work on uh, pretty continuously um, here at Dr. Cog. So it's a really good time uh, to again give you uh, an initial briefing. Um, Andy is going to do two things. He is going to talk about things that happened in 2019 to set us up for a lot of work that is gonna happen in 2020. Uh, and that is going to be conversations that are happening with you as the board of directors, but also a lot of conversations with your staff. Uh, this work really in, uh, involves your staff working with staff here at Dr. Cog uh, to make sure that this product is, good, is as good as it possibly can be. So just know, even if this feels like a behind the scenes uh, type of product that maybe you don't see that often, your staff uh, tends to be pretty engaged uh, in the development of these, of these forecasting products. So I just wanted to kind of set the stage uh, for, for that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andy. Well, uh, thank you for your time and attention tonight. Um, as Brad said, uh, we wanted to take this opportunity just to give you a high level overview of the work we do around household and employment forecasting here at Dr. Cog. Uh, it's been a while since uh, we've presented here about this process. And uh, as Brad noted, uh, there have been some changes uh, since then. Uh, so the work uh, the team is doing for small area forecasting is just one leg of part of a larger forecasting process. Uh, we start with the work of the state demography office. Uh, they start, uh, they are doing the state and county level forecasts around households, uh, the population or the people that make up those households uh, and the jobs. Uh, much of their current work goes out to the year of 2050. Um, I like this uh, relay race. Uh, uh, analogy here, uh, uh, just because uh, uh, this really is a process where we, it, it is, it involves a handoff uh, between us and the state demography office. It isn't just something we look up on uh, the, on their website and take, uh, it is something we work with them on. Um, and so uh, we help, uh, working with them helps understand their work uh, for our uses, but also helps inform some of their assumptions as well. Uh, but their work truly does stop, stop at the county level when it comes to forecasting. And so that's where our work comes in, uh, related to uh, small area forecasting, as Brad said. Uh, we have 2,800 small areas, often called uh, zones or transportation analysis zones. Uh, we rely on a predictive model here known as urban sim uh, for this step, and it uses nine different discrete choice models that simulate household employment uh, location choices uh, with real estate dynamics and within uh, natural and regulatory constraints. Uh, the next step is this uh, towards uh, to our travel demand modeling team uh, and other travel demand modeling efforts around the region. Uh, this is so that uh, their work, they can forecast uh, travel patterns between zones and on the transportation network. And so, uh, the course of 2019, there were some significant changes to how we do this process. Uh, this is just a high-level summary of some of the items that we've uh, we've done this year, uh, last year. Uh, we can now run our model in the cloud. Uh, we can also have the option to pull together county-level growth assumptions. Uh, from the state demographer, often referred to as control totals, uh, to see uh, to help see what the impact is of different what if scenario questions at the regional level. And I'm just going to get a little bit into uh, some more depth on the last two items uh, here. 
Uh, so uh, one of the things that we spent a lot of time doing in 2019 uh, that is related to the land in your jurisdictions in these small areas, all of it is subject to different constraints. Uh, they may be natural constraints, but they're also regulatory ones with your zoning. Uh, we collect and update this data annually uh, from your jurisdictions. Uh, past practice have been to try and boil all that down, all those different types into 17 different regional categories. Uh, while models do need some sort of simplification of reality, uh, we did want to update our approach and try to tune the capacity uh, of each of these areas uh, to the local zoning districts, bypassing uh, the regional categorization whenever possible. Uh, we also, one of the big uh, reasons why we started undertaking model improvements this last year uh, was uh, because uh, we wanted to incorporate what we call scheduled development. Uh, our discrete choice models, while robust, are limited in what variables they can consider. Uh, uh, this is a good approach uh, for a long-range forecast, but uh, may miss nearer-term uh, growth and development assumptions, uh, that local knowledge that can't just be boiled down to different model variables. Uh, so this model component also allows us to regularly incorporate uh, recent observed development that may be, uh, have happened since uh, the, the beginning of our simulation years. And so looking forward to uh, this year, uh, we now get to put all these improvements to work. We're already at work at the regional uh, scenario analysis as part of the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan process. Uh, in quarter two, uh, we'll be providing a second opportunity for local input uh, on the small area forecast. Uh, thankfully, uh, staff in many of your jurisdictions have already provided feedback last September uh, as we began working with a, a, a forecast, a preliminary forecast that be, uh, used regional control totals for the first time uh, and was testing this new zoning approach. Uh, this will be our first opportunity for local feedback after switching back to uh, uh, county control totals uh, and the incorporation of some of this scheduled development information. Uh, in quarter three, the board will have the opportunity to discuss and take action on the resulting small area forecast assumptions uh, for inclusion in uh, the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Thank you. Any questions? All right, we'll move. <coughs> yes, uh, Director Partridge, I'm sorry. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Andy, so the 2,800 zones you talked about, is that encompass the whole Dr. Cog area? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, it includes um, some larger uh, pieces uh, that go uh, beyond the Dr. Cog area and Weld uh, and into Elbert County, but it does cover the whole area. So when you extrapolate data from that, you, is there a possibility to give a footprint to say, I would like to see this footprint, and then you could incorporate what zones are in that footprint, and then you could extrapolate data from that. Is that possible? Uh, yes, it, it could be possible. Uh, the bigger the area, the easier that may be to do to aggregate those areas together. Um, yes, that type of analysis is something we can look at. Great, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Oh, Mr. Chairman, yes, if I may Mr. real quick, as he's, as he's, they're stepping away. This is, I mean, it's a pretty intense endeavor now, right, over the next couple quarters. So please, um, you know, if, you're, if your staff don't think they need to be involved or kind of casually be involved in that, that is not really the right approach. We really want their input and help in shaping, shaping these forecasts, because ultimately this is what we use for our transportation demand forecasting tool, too. So, so please, if you get an opportunity, um, to express how, how necessary it is for them to be involved, uh, please do so. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we'll have uh, item number 13, a briefing on RTD. I always say this, either live or live. I guess it depends on the day, right? Is it live? Yeah. RTD needs live right now. Their program, attachment G in your packet, uh, director of uh, planning and operations, Mr. Ron Pops, or Popsdorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just uh, uh, here to introduce Heather McKillop from RTD. So just by way of setting the stage a little bit, in 2017, RTD convened a working group to evaluate RTD's past programs. Uh, Executive Director Doug Rex uh, served on that work group uh, with RTD. Uh, the group was asked to determine whether changes should be made to RTD's uh, past programs, including whether they should consider a program to subsidize fares for low-income riders. Um, Heather's here to present the 
um, live program Thank you. Part of the outcome of that work. And with that, I'll hand it over to Heather. Good evening, thanks for having me. I'm Heather McKillop, I'm the Chief Financial Officer and Assistant General Manager for Finance Administration. Spew all that out for RTD. So um, I was uh, the one um, responsible for implementing this program along with a lot of um, uh, stakeholders and many of your counterparts um, participated in the program. So we wanna thank them for all that hard work. It was a year long process and it was very uh, tedious, but we made some, um, some huge steps, I think, and um, I'm able to present tonight some updated statistics, And but I wanted to start and talk a little bit about how we got here. Is that going in and out, or is that my imagination? Imagination. Um, okay. It's late. <laughs> um, so I, I, I know the evening's um, going on, so I'm not going to uh, go through every slide in detail. There's, they're in your packet. But I did want to point out some um, important steps and, and starting about how we got there. So I've been with RTD four and a half years. And um, before I came, um, the, uh, there was a Mile High Task Force on affordable fares that was working with RTD on trying to figure out a way to move forward with some type of low income program. Um, the idea was we had a um, discount for youth, we had a discount for seniors, we have discounted for disabled, but there wasn't anything to assist those that were transit dependent and low income um, that could benefit for that type of program. So um, as you can imagine, um, at the bottom line of everything is money. And so um, what was being proposed at that time was quite an expensive program. And so we struggled with ways of being able to deal with that. And also we had mixed reaction on our board as to whether this was the right direction to go or not. Um, in April 2016, the Colorado Fiscal Institute released a report. Um, the title is there, but I just um, have some excerpts from it I wanted to point out because these should sound very familiar as I go to how we implemented the program. Um, they uh, wanted discounts provided by RT that were not targeted at low-income transit riders, meaning we didn't have a program like that. We had a program for youth and elderly. They, went, they felt that there were structural flaws in our existing nonprofit program that we had. Um, the idea being if you were affiliated with a nonprofit that happened to participate in the program, because we had caps on it, um, then you got the benefit. But if you weren't affiliated with a nonprofit, then you had no access to that benefit. And then they also wanted to make sure that low-income riders would be income verified once a year by an authorized organization or institution, and that there would be some proof of verification that they could use to show that they were eligible for that particular um, benefit. We then, the board um, convened a 25 million, uh, million, it felt like million, sorry, but it was only member, 25 member. <laughs> Doug can relate, huh? Uh, <laughs> So 25 member working group and um, those um, individuals, as I mentioned, meant, uh, uh, met over a one year period of time, um, some a little more often than that because we had subgroups. Um, and uh, again, a lot of your um, counterparts were involved in that process. This wasn't their only charge, but it was a large portion of the charge of that group um, trying to come up with a low income program and how do we make it cost neutral. Um, I'm not going to go through these objectives. These were the um, financial objectives that we had, which we still have. Um, and this is what we were looking at as far as um, uh, different um, proposals. So one of the proposals um, that was most prevalent in the group was to do a 50% discount at 150% of federal poverty level. When we looked at the dollar amounts, we just couldn't, couldn't come up with that um, type of um, loss in revenue. So we were able to settle on a 40% of 185% of federal po poverty level is where we ended up, and we were able to accommodate that through other changes that were made in our past programs. Uh, again, not going to go through this. These were implemented in January of um, 2019, so they've been in effect for about a year. The um, low income program, however, was not implemented till um, July of 2019. So we've been, um, had the program now active for five months, and I'm gonna give you those results in a little bit. Uh, this was just our process and timeline to get there. Um, this is where we ended up with the final changes after the board, um, uh, the staff made recommendation and the board adopted it. 
And this is where we ended up. So through March um, 31st of 2020 um, is the chart that you see up there um, for a household that would qualify at 185% of the federal poverty level. Those are updated every year um, by the federal government, and so we will adapt accordingly um, in April of each year to adjust those to accommodate the new chart. This is what the fares would look like. So if you um, buy a three-hour pass um, on a local bus or rail, it'd be $1.80, $3.15 for regional, and $6.30 for airport. A day pass would be $3.60, $6.30 for regional, and a day pass also gets you airport fare too at that same $6.30. Um, long road to implementation, especially for those that worked on the program. Uh, we um, had a very, very collaborative process with the state of Colorado. Um, their peak system um, deals with low-income individuals, and um, we decided to go the route of accessing, if the state would allow us that, um, already um, verified group of individuals. So the thought process behind it was, is if we could access their database and people could apply and they were already in their database and um, pre-qualified, so to speak, because they met these thresholds, it would be a very quick process of getting them approved versus making everyone start from scratch with an income verification process, which has proven to work quite well. We also have a partnership with the City and County Denver Human Services, um, and also we've been um, reaching out to each of the county um, human services, and they've been um, assisting us in getting the word out. Basically, if somebody comes in to apply for other services, they point out that they can be potentially be eligible for the live card, and um, vice versa. What they were anticipating by working with us is if people came in for the live card, they would also apply for other benefits that might be available to them. So it's very been a very good working relationship with the counties. Um, this was just a little bit about the nonprofit. You probably have heard about this if you have um, people that are not exactly thrilled that we um, have um, taken away the 50% um, uh, fare that they were able to give to low-income um, people that qualified under their particular programs. Um, in order to um, make it a um, fair system across the board, um, we um, are having all the income verification done by the um, City and County of Denver Human Services and the PEAK program. Um, and the way that works currently now is if you're an applicant and you go into the PEAK system and you apply for a live card, if you are already receiving benefits um, with the, um, that meet the criteria, which most of the benefit programs um, both at the federal and state level do, then you are um, approved instantly. So you are then processed that night. The information comes to us at RTD. We send it to our card printer to get a card, um, and we're averaging about um, seven to 14 days. Um, we're looking at improving that time frame, but that's currently what we are averaging to get the card out. Once you have the card, you can buy the discounted fare. Um, we only offer it through the MyRide card or mobile ticketing at this time, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. If you are a nonprofit, you can still buy um, fare media from us for low income, but it's a 40% discount. Um, they do have access to 10 ride ticket books, which are paper products in addition to that to give out. So you, there is a benefit for the nonprofits. Post implementation, um, application processes through the state's PEAK website. Um, that it, the counties are very familiar with that process. That's what their human services departments use. Um, you can um, apply again, not just for our discount card, but you can also apply for other services while you're in there. Um, you can apply for family members, um, not just yourself, those type of things. Um, here are the websites. I put it out there because we are really starting a process now to get the word out. We have now been active for five months. Um, at the end of January, we'll be starting an active campaign to tell people about this discount. But one of the things we learned through this process, and I'm going to bring up, um, I, these numbers are old, so I'm going to give you the new numbers. But what we've learned is that the majority of our denials, almost 75% um, of our denials, are because people get a better discount in one of our other discount programs. So we tell them that when they go into the website. So if they put in their age and they're 66, 
we will reject you and we tell you that you have a discount that's available to you that's a better discount than what this program provides. If you're trying to apply for a child that's 16, we will do the same thing. So we'll approve you if you qualify, but if, you're ch if you have children you're applying for, we'll tell you your children can get a better discount at 70%. So we do provide that feedback, and the majority of our denials, um, like I said, over 70-something percent are related to age. So what we learned from that, um, and also interaction with the Denver Human Services, is that people were not aware that we have these better discounts if you're in different categories. Um, so we have this part of this outreach we're gonna be doing is not only advertising what we can do with the live card for you, but also these other discounts that are available. So I just want to give you the latest stats. In five months, we actually, instead of 1,182, we have 4,609 applications. We have 2,767 applications approved as being categorically eligible, and that means that they were already in the system. So the ma majority of our people are already in the system. We had 1,285 people denied, but over 70% of that was because of age. The other um, 296 were due to being out of district, so people applying that do not have addresses within the district. Um, and then we currently have 557 pending. The majority of those are waiting for a photo. Um, so what that means is you cannot proceed in the application process if you haven't uploaded a fo photo. We'll save your application, and then we continue to send you reminders to please submit a photo. Um, so, and part of that is they may have uploaded a photo, but it's of their dog, or <laughs> their meme, or um, you should see the really interesting things that I've seen um, being uploaded. I, I, to make my PowerPoint more interesting, maybe I should do that in the future, because I like the little relay people. Um, that was a hard act to follow. Um, but yeah, so there's some interesting things that go out there when we just say, please just take a headshot. So. Um, some of the things that we're working on right now is this is an evolving program, right? This is one of the first in the country. There's only two other entities that have done it, and they have not implemented quite this way. Um, we feel like we're one of the better ones that have been implemented, but that's, you know, I'm a little prejudiced with that. Um, but we continue to evolve, so we do have issues. So the nonprofits are concerned about being able to give out um, uh, fair media that they used to be able to just hand out. Um, now they have to have proof that the person's eligible. And so they're concerned about how do they get their clients signed up. Um, the other thing is the homeless population. We have pro provided accommodations for homeless individuals to get their um, mail at the um, county offices that provide that. And there's a lot of nonprofits that we're working with right now that provide that service also. So as long as they provide an address of one of those entities that's within the region, they qualify as being a district person. Um, the other thing we're working with the Homeless Coalition is just getting people enrolled, and that would be the same thing for any other nonprofits or anybody out there that maybe not be as computer literate as um, someone else. And so what we're uh, we, um, working with the city and county of Denver on, the Human Services Department, is um, maybe we have a roving individual that goes to different locations every week um, across the region and helps people apply, right? So they have services. Um, so um, Denver's interested in hearing about our proposal um, and how that might work. Um, but for an example, maybe on Monday they're at the Denver Library, and Tuesday they're up in Boulder, and on Wednesday they're in Arapahoe County, but they're in a, it's the same place every week so that people know where to go, and it's also accessible from hopefully transit um, and other methods, walking. So that's really where we are right now. Um, we um, continue to take feedback. Um, I have to say the state of Colorado and Denver have been just unbelievable to work with. And I say that I used to work for the state for 20 years and that was not my experience <laughs> working with OIT for that period, but they have just been unbelievable to work with in this. Um, and they continue to make changes for us as we bring up um, new issues that um, we continue to get from people and barriers that we see um, a, as those are brought forward. So um, we have some great partners in this. Um, we continue to reach out for, through other counties. Um, our concern right now is we know everybody's busy, right? So we don't wanna add another workload. 
We are also working on some public-private partnership ventures right now that would allow various people to use our card for other discounts out there, um, and vice versa, to, you know, might happen. So um, stay tuned. We're very excited about the program, but we really need to get the word out. So if you have any questions about it, make sure they can contact me, um, go through Doug or anybody here at Dr. Coggin, they can get a hold of me and we'll be glad to take that feedback or provide you with materials or anything else. Or if you have a place that we might be able to go to help assist people, we're also um, looking for those opportunities. So thank you very much, appreciate your time. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Director Brockett. Heather, thanks so much for that presentation. It's an exciting program. Great to see it getting off the ground. One question I had for you. So in, in Boulder, uh, through the outcome of this past program, one outcome that we're struggling with was the removal of discounts for the EcoPass program. So the, the whole system's kind of struggling with that change. But is, is there a way to integrate uh, these discounts with people who have EcoPasses so that you, have, you, you live in a neighborhood, you have an EcoPass, but actually you're lower income, Mm -hmm. And so you really should be charged less for, for the fares that you're writing. It, how is that going to work out? We've been having that um, discussion with the NECO um, passels or the neighborhood um, eco pass um, holders. Um, and one of the things that we're um, working with some of those right now is if you have a majority of the community that is low income, then it makes more sense actually for you to get off our eco pass program and have us provide you another methodology to get that discount. We are not offering that discount in conjunction with the EcoPass because there is still a bulk discount, so to speak, built into that. Um, and from our modeling numbers, um, we don't think we could afford that at this point in time. But we have been able to work with some of the neighborhoods up in Boulder to um, experiment to see if that works better for them and is a much lower cost. In the future, we're moving to, um, and thank you, Dr. Cog, an account-based ticketing system. You um, gave us a grant to buy the validators. Um, with that new electronic system, um, we will have more options to model more of those things and try them and see where we're going to be. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention, though, is we're not slamming the door on that not happening in the future. We are currently monitoring how many live cards we have out there how many people are actually using the discounted product. And then if we are below our targeted numbers, we will start looking at offering other things, such as maybe combining those discounts, or the other one, big request we get is, can we have paper products and not just have it on a, a, a card, smart card or a um, mobile ticketing device? So, um, so we continue to explore those things, but yes, I've spent a lot of time with the neighborhoods up in <laughs> Boulder on this issue. Good. They can use the support. Although I just I, I thought that the uh, the neighborhood eco passes were being billed a hundred percent of the previous year's fair utilization. Usage. Right. So, what kind of bulk discount then would be? Involved? Well, because um, we don't charge by person anymore, we charge on utilization. So, it, there's kind of a built-in um, based on um, not having to pay for every single individual. You only pay for the trips that people actually use. Now, it just depends on. We have some neighborhoods that have very heavily utilization, so their numbers went up significantly. We had other neighbors where their costs went down significantly. But, so. there's, but there's not a discount per se, it's just spread out over a Correct, it's spread over a larger, and so by default, you're not paying as much as you would. So I'll just give you an example. A regional pass is $200 a month. We charge $200 for the neighborhood for one person for the whole year, potentially, if you divide it out by a person, that's huge. Right, compared to a person that worked into a store and had to buy a regional pass You're on a, a month. Heavy utilizer, yeah. Correct. That's Director Dell. How about workforce passes? So, how how, how do these small business owners uh, try to provide some mechanism to educate their workforce for passes? Because they're not living in Golden; they're coming to Golden to work. Mm -hmm. So, what's what's the mechanism? So we have a variety of options for businesses. One is the business eco pass, um, but that doesn't work for everybody, um, especially if you're a smaller business, um, because the larger the business, you probably get a, a, you know economies of scale there. Um, but we also have what we call a flex pass, where you only buy it for the people that want to use it. You can pass on some of the costs. You can use your transit benefits to offset that as an employee. Um, so um, what I what I ask people to do is if you're interested and you're an employer, we always ask you to reach out to us and there's usually a um, product that we can find that fits your particular circumstances. 
because it's hard to say one thing fits all. We have so many products right now and so many different ways of um, uh, selling those products and also offering up. One of the big things we're doing now is trying to get people moved to mobile ticketing with the uh, Denver school system right now. We push all of their tickets out through the mobile ticketing device. So their kids get their tickets through um, their phones and it is been very successful and they only get charged for what the kids activate in the past we would have charged them for anything we pushed out now we only have can we know what they've used so we only have to charge them for what they actually activate so we're making strides and and, and working through those all on of those 4,000 people that you processed mm -hmm. what kind of ridership are you getting? So we can't tell exact ridership, but we can tell usage, right? So right now, um, it hasn't ramped up as, as much as we had expected as far as the ridership goes. Um, and that's why we're gonna reevaluate it at the end of the first quarter of this year. If it doesn't get where we wanna be, we're gonna look at different options, um, maybe expanding the program um, also, because we, we agreed to reconsider that. The other thing we would look at first though is how we offer the products. And we think a lot of it might be because they can't pay at the bus, on the bus when they get on, or they can't buy a pa paper ticket. And those are some of the things we'll look at sooner rather than later. Director Stolzman. Thank you. Uh, I just like to start out by saying transit's very important to our communities, and um, you know something that we talk about a lot and spend a lot of time on. Um, so I do appreciate that the past program working group was attempting to try to correct some things and make things more equal. It has certainly created a lot of confusion in the different past programs, and we've had to spend a lot of time with education, like for the student pass, and it, it just because of all of the because of all of the different passes, it is very confusing for people where they qualify, how much does it cost to take the bus, how can I get a ticket for the bus. Um, so I, I think there's a real opportunity there to make it sense, make sense. Um, if, I, if I give my contact information either to Mr. Van Meter or yourself, would it be possible for me to understand the overhead of this program? I mean, mm -hmm. it just seems like, you know, 614 people got passes and it's a very complicated system. Um, and in the old system, people were able to just go to our community centers that they're very comfortable with and get pass books and take the bus. And now there's this whole qualification and headquarters and go down there and get your picture certified and do this and do that. And, and they used to be able to just go to the community center with their kids, get a pass book, take their kids to the grocery store and buy food. So I'd like to understand the overhead associated with this new program and the number of people that are actually able to utilize it. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, let's move on. Thank you. We have community reports. The, the chair requests that these reports are brief so we can get through the evening because we're behind now. Uh, I think I could blame Brad on that one, but um, reports from the stack. Uh, Director Jones. Thank you. All right, so the stack has changed its meeting schedule to meet the week before transportation committee meetings, commission meetings to try to um, have more of an impact on their thinking and, and make the, the timing work. Um, probably the biggest um, item we discussed at the last meeting was um, CDOT's proposal for how to spend CMAC funds. Um, they proposed to keep the overall distribution formula intact, which is good for us in particular, not decreasing any money going to the non-attainment area but for the funds that um, as areas outside the non-attainment area finish their maintenance programs for PM10, to have those dollars flow to a statewide mobility fund that's focused on EV infrastructure. Stack didn't have time to weigh in. It was a little controversy for the Weld County folks, um, but I think Dr. Cog's supportive of that, and I think the stack will get there. Um, uh, we also heard an overview on CDOT's policy directive 14 scorecard and all the different indicators there, which is being updated. And we got an update on the Central 70 project, which is underway and due to be done in 2022. Thank you, Director Jones. Next up, a report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Atchison. We did have our annual retreat this uh, past Saturday, and um, Mayor Olson, I don't know how they tried to give you away to Lakewood, but I'm glad you stayed in Inglewood because we enjoyed the... <laughs> Is that what it was? I don't think you want it. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, 
Yeah, we had an interesting uh, conversation. The governor came and spent a few minutes with us, but what got really interesting was the Speaker of the House, when she came, scheduled for, I think, 20 minutes, and we went an hour and a half. So uh, I would tell you that I think there is a very big challenge between what the governor, Speaker, and the President of the various pieces and finance and budget of what is available for funding in the state going to the group uh, they're not on the same page, I hate to tell them. So. But uh, the big part of what we were looking at is uh, a couple of bills that are uh, making its way through the petition process, and one of the biggest ones that had the longest amount of conversation was the 1% growth cap. And that got on a good part of the day trying to figure out what we're going to do with that. Uh, Mayor Starker made a great uh, presentation on the Homeless and Hunger Committee, and uh, we had something that looked like a human that was there that kept floating around the room. Uh, the mayor pro tem of Arvada brought it. It was very disturbing. You can tell that to the mayor, not to me, because I have nothing to do with what he does. Well, I know, but the, but the picture of the mayor of Arvada in the various costuming that he was in in those life-size stand-ups was kind of disturbing. We had several mayors who became distraught and, and left early. <laughs> I don't know why my mayor would think that it's okay to put cutouts. Well, he was because he was sitting on a beach in Mexico instead of showing up for the meeting. He had cutouts that were different attires, depending but all on. all glitter? He had funny socks. No glitter. But I don't even know. Uh, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> oh, uh, Mr. Chairman, just one quick thing. There was a huge turnover this past year in the number of mayors. Best example I can give you is Adams County has seven out of the nine mayors that are new to the mayor's position. So in the metro area, we saw a lot of turnover. I think the conversation was 30%, right, of all the mayor uh, metro mayors? 19, 19 mayors in the metro area turned were up, 29 statewide. Most of those uh, that were up turned over, uh, either through term limits or other reasons. Actions. Thank you very much. Moving to the Metro Area County Commissioners, uh, Director Partridge. Our first meeting would be January 31st of this year. Oh, great. That's the report. Thank you. Uh, the Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, Jayla Sanchez Warren. Oh, we did not have a meeting. Oh, all right, thank you. <laughs> we'll keep on moving. Uh, the RAC, the Air Regional Area Council uh, Quality Council, Mr. Rex. We also did not meet uh, since our last Perfect. board meet. All right, let's keep cruising. 470 Authority, Director Teal. We're meeting on January 30th. Yeah, that's great. Keep going. <laughs> you back on? Trying to get going. To re uh, report on CDOT. I don't think there's anyone from CDOT, so we'll keep cruising. Uh, fast Tracks, uh, Bill Van Meter. Hello. Oh, yeah, okay. It's We're on. Um, nothing to report on Fast Tracks, but two other items of interest regarding RTD. One is that our process for selecting an interim general manager and CEO is proceeding. The five finalists have been announced to the public and the RTD Board of Directors intends to meet in executive session on the 28th of this month prior to their regularly scheduled board meeting um, in an attempt to select one of those five candidates to be our interim general manager prior to kicking off a process to find a permanent general manager and CEO. More information available in the press, press releases online at www.rtd-denver.com or by talking to me later. And the other item that our board discussed last night was the service changes for May that are being proposed to address our ongoing shortage of bus and rail operators and the impact that has been having on our service. So those service changes and proposed service reductions were reviewed by our board of directors last night 
and we'll be going to a series of 15 to 20 public hearings between the dates of February 17th and March 5th in those areas that would be affected. Um, so stay tuned, we'll be holding public hearings in many of your communities in that time frame, mid-February to early March, regarding these proposed May service changes and reductions. Thank you, Peter. I'd also like to add that you can give feedback on the five candidates, not seeing the email that's come out, or would like to provide feedback on any of those candidates, I'd encourage you to do so uh, before they have their executive meeting. And the date, um, or the drop dead, or providing feedback to our board, various mechanisms, you can do that, and the press release and our website provide that, provide that information. The deadline is 5 p.m. on the 23rd of January, and the letters of interest and resumes for each of the five candidates are also available. Or you can email your representative for RHD. Informational items in your packet, the nominating committee report, it's attachment H of the incoming uh, executive team, and then also uh, item 16 is the transportation improvement program, the TIP administrative, administrative modifications. Next meeting, business meeting is February 19th. Our workshop I think is the 4th. Uh, fifth, excuse me. Uh, so we will see you then. Any other matters by the members? Yes, Director Dell. Colorado Cowboy gathering in Golden <laughs> on tomorrow through the weekend. <laughs> Yeehaw, come here. Good music and good poetry. Colorado Cowboy. <laughs> Mike wasn't on during that, but sure. <laughs> uh, if there's no any other matters, we'll be adjourned.